the Staff of Moses. It created some of the most awe-inspiring miracles in the Bible. It's a very powerful ritual instrument. It amazed the Pharaoh as it turned into a snake. It was one of the first weapons of mass destruction. It brought forth the great plagues of Egypt. Some kind of conductor for divine power. It parted the Red Sea and drowned the Pharaoh's army. But what happened to this instrument of divine power? One man believes he knows what became of it. The Staff of Moses was the most powerful artifact in history. He claims the famous staff went through ancient cities and traveled the modern world. It might even have survived the Titanic. And he believes he knows where it is today. Could he possibly be right? Birmingham, England, the 1st of January, 2000. It's Britain's second biggest city. It's also a gold mine of libraries and museums. And it's the home of one of the country's most tenacious historical detectives. On the first day of the new millennium, Graham Phillips is pondering his next challenge. Phillips is an investigator of myths. He's tracked legends from the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant to the location of King Arthur's Camelot. Tales other academics are unwilling or even afraid to touch. But the story Phillips always wanted to crack was Moses. Moses is the founder of the Israelite religion. The character that seems to have started it all. And so it was him that I decided to investigate. Phillips was particularly intrigued by the staff of Moses. The sturdy stick wasn't just an ancient walking aid. It was a weapon that could tame nature and bring an empire to its knees. If the story of Moses is true, then Phillips believes his staff could still be out there, somewhere. He's determined to track it down. Phillips begins his research. He learns that although Moses was a Hebrew, he was in fact born in Egypt, after his people had been taken there to work as slaves. Moses' birth takes place in the context of real danger and threat in the land of Egypt. The Hebrews are growing as a people and the Egyptian authorities think they might pose some kind of military threat. A death sentence is passed by the Pharaoh on all Hebrew boys. Fearing for his life, his mother hides him in a basket amongst the reeds on the River Nile. The 
daughter of the pharaoh, we are told, found this baby floating in this little basket in the bulrushes and decided to adopt him as her own son. So he has two aspects here. He's not only a, a Semite, a, a, a Hebrew, if you like, he's also an Egyptian prince adopted into the court of Pharaoh. Although he is raised an Egyptian prince, Moses doesn't forget his Hebrew roots. One day, he makes a decision that changes his life forever. So Moses grows up and he sees an Egyptian oppressing a fellow Hebrew. And he steps in and he actually kills the Egyptian. Fearing for his life, Moses flees east to the land of Midian. Moses spends the next 40 years living and hiding in the desert. As Phillips reads, one day, Moses, now an old man, hears the voice of God. While Moses is in the wilderness, he comes across a bush which is burning but is not consumed. God speaks to Moses from the flames. He tells Moses to throw his staff on the ground. Miraculously, it turns into a snake. God tells him to grab the snake by the tail. Incredibly, it turns into a staff again. It becomes Moses' supernatural weapon. If we are to believe what we are told in the Old Testament, the staff of Moses was the most powerful artifact in history. God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and lead the Hebrews to the Promised Land. Pharaoh refuses to let the Hebrews leave. So time and again, Moses uses his staff to threaten him. Moses is a ritual specialist. He pulls out all sorts of magic tricks to try and intimidate Pharaoh into letting the Israelite people go. He turns it into a snake. But then Moses says, I can do far more with this staff. And with this staff, he calls down 10 plagues upon Egypt. Dead fish, dead cattle, lice, flies, and locusts. Moses unleashes plagues of hail and darkness. The state is systematically dismantled. These plagues are the prelude to the most terrible plague of all, the death of the firstborn. And it's at that point it would seem that Pharaoh is then finally broken. Finally, Pharaoh relents. What the Bible calls the Exodus begins. The Hebrews are free at last. Then, Pharaoh goes back on his word. The Hebrews become trapped between Pharaoh's army and the Red Sea. Once again, Moses' staff comes to the rescue. It's the most awesome display of power in the Old Testament. Moses uses his staff to part the Red Sea. The Hebrews escape. 
and Pharaoh's army is drowned by the returning waters. Following the parting of the Red Sea, the Bible says that Moses and the Israelites would wander through the wilderness for 40 long years. Only then do they come through Jordan to the very edge of the Promised Land. But before he enters it, Moses dies. As for his mighty staff, it vanishes from history. For investigator Graham Phillips, the disappearance is one of the great mysteries of the Bible. Where on earth was the staff of Moses? We don't know what happened to Moses' staff according to the Bible. We can only assume that it was buried with him. Most people that could afford it were buried with goods in their graves. Israelite graves have grave goods in them. Little jugs, they might be a dagger, beads, a necklace, a, a scarab of some sort. Philip's task seems clear. Find the grave of Moses, and it's likely he will find the staff. As I'd written a few books about searching for mysterious graves, I thought, why not Moses? Let's try my hand at finding the grave of Moses. Phillips assumes that the grave of Moses must be somewhere near where he died. But where exactly is that? Phillips turns to the Bible. It must contain record of where Moses was buried. The first reference he finds bluntly states that, no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. Phillips has barely begun his quest and already he's hit a brick wall. He can't believe that the burial place of Moses has been forgotten. There are other places in the Bible that Phillips can look. In the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers. Both contain the same promising lead. They tell about the burial place of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Twice in the Bible, in the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, it tells us that Moses is buried near his brother Aaron. The text says Aaron was buried on Mount Hor. It's possible the brothers could have been buried close together. Now, presumably, Moses had to be somewhere near Mount Hor. Fortunately, Phillips knows exactly where Mount Hor is. To find the staff, he needs to get to Jordan. Philip drives from the capital, Amman, south into the desert. The mountain where Aaron is said to be buried, Mount Hor, is also known as Jebel Harun. It dominates the skyline over Jordan's most famous ruins, the Rose City of Petra.
Petra is one of the great wonders of the world. Fabulous, wonderful temples and tombs cut into this red sandstone. And it's a secret place, it's hidden away. You have to go down the seek this narrow gorge to reach it. These amazing sandstone structures were built by a civilization known as the Nabataeans. They date from the third century BC, around a millennium after the time of Moses. Phillips is struck by the sheer scale of the task before him. The site is huge. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Philip starts by looking for any features in the landscape that link this place to Moses. Suddenly, Phillips comes across Wadi Musa. It means the Valley of Moses. There are Arabic traditions about Moses and Israelites being there, that Petra did play a role in the story of the wandering years between Egypt and the Promised Land. So Phillips could indeed be following in the footsteps of Moses. But are there any more landmarks that tie this place to the stories of Moses? A little further on, Phillips comes across a holy spring. It's called the Ain Musa, the spring of Moses. And it's said to be where Moses struck his staff against a rock to create a miraculous spring so that the Israelites didn't die of thirst while they're wandering in the desert. Confident he's on the right track, Philip still hasn't found anything resembling a Hebrew grave. He needs a more obvious clue, like a memorial stone. But how would he even know it if he found it? Graham Phillips is on a quest to find the Staff of Moses. The Staff Moses could turn into a snake at will. At the foot of Mount Hor, Phillips looks again at the Bible's reference to the burial of Moses. He finds a detail he had not spotted before. Deuteronomy states that Moses was buried over against Beth Peor. Beth Peor means, literal translation, the house Beth of the snake. But it can also be used to mean place of rather than just house. So Beth Peor actually means the place of the snake. The Book of Numbers is even more promising. It says that when the Israelites were in the wilderness, Moses built a magical icon of a snake. And Moses, with the power of God, has power over this creature. He scours the ancient valley, searching for images of a snake. And then, in the shadow of Mount Hor, Phillips finds an extraordinary structure. A massive statue, and it's shaped like a coiled snake. I was standing 
as far as I was concerned, at the very place where Moses was buried. And the Bible says that to this day, no man shall know the place where Moses' sepulchre lies. And there I was, at it. It had to be somewhere in that area. I was absolutely thrilled. It was the high point of my whole life. Phillips looks around for signs of the grave itself. He's convinced the staff must be close by. There are endless caves all around the snake monument. Phillips is powerless to investigate. Never mind excavate. Petra is Jordan's national treasure. He'll be in serious trouble if he damages the fragile sandstone. It's a frustrating end to his quest. Phillips feels he's closer than anyone else has ever been to locating the grave of Moses. The mythical staff remains as elusive as ever. Reluctantly, he returns home. Back in Birmingham, Phillips wonders what more he can do to find the staff of Moses. He throws himself back into his books, only to find that his detective work could be questionable. His translation of the key clue, Beth Peor, the house of the snake, is not shared by others. Peor certainly occurs in the Hebrew Bible in the words Baal Peor and Beth Peor, house of Peor and God of Peor. I don't myself know of any word that means snake that looks anything like Peor. Frankly, I'm very skeptical. Phillips can't answer the skeptics. Although by accident or design, he has identified several features in Petra that tradition links to Moses. If he can't search in the field, he wonders if he can find leads closer to home. In Birmingham's libraries and museums, his native town is a treasure trove of artifacts and historical reports. Did earlier explorers by chance find out about the grave of Moses? One account in particular catches his eye. It's a description of a strange tomb. It's the diaries of two British adventurers. The painter, David Roberts, and his friend, John Kinnear. They visited Petra in the 19th century, a journey captured in Roberts' landscapes. And I discovered that in 1839, they went to excavate various old tombs in Petra in Jordan. It appears that the men explored behind the snake monument and discovered a tomb. According to Phillips, Kinnear and Roberts didn't think the tomb was anything special. Phillips reads on to see if the explorers found any trace of a body. But no human remains were discovered. Just as Phillips is about to put the report away, he notes that they did find something. It's not a skeleton. It's better than that. A black painted wooden staff. 
The staff could very well have been the staff that Moses had with which he parted the Red Sea. But what did they do with the staff? July 3rd, 2000. It's been six months since Graham Phillips began his quest to find the staff of Moses. Now, thanks to 19th century adventurers Roberts and Kinnear's reports at Petra, at last he's picked up a scent. It's now a matter of seeing where the trail takes him. He starts to put together the pieces of the puzzle to try and trace what happened to the staff. It appears that Kinnear does bring the staff back to England. But it doesn't stay with Kinnear for long. Phillips says the staff falls into the hands of John Wilson, a collector of antiquities. Phillips believes that Wilson then sells the staff to the Earl of Devon he keeps it at his estate at Powderham Castle in the southwest of England. Then, in early 1912, the staff is sold again, this time to a Mr. Stanley May, an American collector of antiquities. According to the diary of Lady Devon at that time, an American businessman and friend of the family by the name of Stanley May came to stay and had a considerable interest in a number of the artifacts that Lord Devon possessed. And one of the artifacts that he let him have was this staff. Phillips has now traced the staff all the way from Petra in 1839 to Southampton in 1912. It seems that on the 10th of April, 1912, May takes the staff and his other treasures and boards a ship bound for the United States. Then Phillips makes an extraordinary discovery. This is the ship's first journey. It is also its last. Unfortunately for Stanley May, the ship which he had chosen to travel on was the Titanic. When I traced the staff to the Titanic and knew where the Titanic ended up, I thought, that's it, I've traced it so far and it's at the bottom of the Atlantic. Phillips now faces a new question. What happened to the May family? Did they survive? And did they have the staff with them? Hoping against all hope, Phillips checks the records. He knows the odds are low. Of the more than 2,000 people on the Titanic, two-thirds drowned. And only 700 survivors were picked up by the rescue ship Carpathia. The May family is not mentioned in the list of survivors. He turns to the list of the dead and notices something strange. There is no record of the May family among the dead either. Could the Mays have somehow escaped this infamous tragedy? Phillips discovers that the Mays were not on board when the ship sank. Well, incredibly luckily, Stanley May was in fact not bound for New York himself, although the Titanic was. 
They disembarked at Queenstown because it was their intention to have a week's driving touring holiday in Southern Ireland. Stanley May and the famous staff had narrowly avoided an icy demise. So where was the staff now? Phillips can't quite believe the turn of events. The survival of the staff is a miracle worthy of the Bible. The staff had survived. It wasn't at the bottom of the Atlantic. What I had to do next is to find out what the May family did with it. Phillips is firmly back on the trail. A year after the Titanic disaster, it appears that May sells the staff to Edward Ayrton, a distinguished British archaeologist. Ayrton dies in 1914. His artifacts are packed and shipped away to New York. They are gifted to the Metropolitan Museum. Maybe the staff is in America after all. As Phillips reads on, he discovers that some artifacts were sent elsewhere. One item does not cross the Atlantic. It stays in England. A priestly staff. Phillips is astonished to discover where the staff ends up. In Birmingham Museum. So I raced, literally, down the stairs, out the door, across the courtyard separating the, the library from the museum, up the stairs and into the Egyptian gallery. It was it. It was the staff that was found next to the Snake Monument in the 1830s. And it was still there on public display. I mean, if I was right and all my research was correct, which I believed it was, then I was looking at the staff that, according to the Bible, Moses had used to part the Red Sea. Astonished is not the word I would use. Knocked out is probably closer to it. The staff is a thing of beauty. 53 inches long and painted black with white hieroglyphics. Could this be the staff of Moses? the first step for Phillips to translate the inscription. It's not written in Hebrew, but in Egyptian hieroglyphics. That's when the doubts creep in. Phillips finds that the hieroglyphics say the staff belongs to the butler or steward of the Pharaoh's daughter, a man named Tuthmosis. The inscription makes no reference to Moses at all. Having read the inscription on the staff, it's perfectly clear that the staff belongs to um, somebody called Stat Moser, who is the butler of a royal princess. Could this be a case of mistaken identity? Could Moses and Tuthmosis be the same person?
Jerusalem. Two and a half thousand years ago, this is where the story of Moses was written down. But it was also recorded in the first century AD by the Jewish historian Josephus. He writes that Moses wasn't just a prince. He was also commander of Pharaoh's forces. Turning to Egyptian history, investigator Graham Phillips discovers a commander who fits the bill. I was looking for a figure that might fit with the character that Josephus described as a general. And there was one in 1360 BC. He was not only a general, he also acted as the steward to the pharaoh. And his name was Tutmosis. It could all be pure coincidence, but Phillips finds an even more direct parallel between Moses and Tuthmosis. The clue is in the story of the Exodus. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and into the Sinai wilderness. For Phillips, it's the timing of the Exodus that's critical. Many Bible scholars agree that it occurred in the middle of the 14th century BC. Amazingly, Phillips discovers that Tuthmosis may have left Egypt too, and at exactly the same time in history. Phillips finds the evidence in a tomb he believes was prepared for Tuthmosis. The tomb of Tuthmosis, the steward to the pharaoh Amenhotep IV, was found by the Italian archaeologist Giovanni Belzoni in the Valley of the Kings. According to Phillips, Belzoni noticed that the tomb did not contain the body of Tuthmosis. Philip's interpretation of Belzoni's find is controversial. Giovanni Belzoni most certainly did not find the tomb of a prince that Moser. Belzoni has left an extremely good account of his excavations, and we know exactly what tombs he found. And a prince that Moser was certainly not amongst them. People who say that Tutmosis' tomb hasn't been found are correct in as much as the body of Tutmosis buried in his tomb has not been found. What has been found is a tomb that had been prepared for him. For Phillips, the empty tomb of Tutmosis is a telling clue. The discovery of a tomb which was prepared for a person of very high status which was never used, it was never robbed, is a sure indicator that the person had been disgraced in some way, probably exiled. Phillips wonders if perhaps Tuthmosis turned against the Egyptian gods. Did he drop Tooth? the moon god, from his name. And instead, as plain Moses, embraced the god of the Israelites. The dating of Tuthmosis' vanishing act is 1360 BC. For many, the same time as the Exodus. For Phillips, that is too much of a coincidence. There's no definitive proof that Tutmosis actually led the Israelites to freedom. What there is, is pretty convincing evidence 
that their flight to freedom did take place at exactly the same time as he disappears from history. It all begins to make sense. Both men grew up in the royal household. Both men were military commanders. Both men vanished from Egypt at the same time. For Phillips, they must be the same person. When I realized, I was overwhelmed. Phillips is convinced that the staff in Birmingham Museum is the staff of Moses. But few Egyptologists share his confidence. There was a Prince Thutmose who, as an officer in the army, However, Thutmose was an extremely common name during the 18th dynasty. There were four pharaohs of that name, a number of princes and various nobles and other commoners as well. So it's often possible to mistake one individual for one or more others. Phillips is so convinced of his discovery, he tries to enlist the support of others. He approaches the current custodians of the staff, Birmingham Museum, but they too are unconvinced by Philip's claims. The curators of Birmingham Museum now will obviously not endorse the fact that this is the staff of Moses. That's fine, but unfortunately they have no records really pertaining to that staff going back much earlier than 1950. The museum does admit that the staff's early history is unclear. In theory, it could be a Victorian forgery. It could have been that Roberts and Kinnear just made the whole thing up. Maybe they didn't even go to Petra or Egypt or anywhere else with all these artifacts they came back with and sold to people. Phillips wants nothing more than to establish the truth of the staff one way or another. He wants a radiocarbon test to determine the age of the wood. If the carbon dating came up with a central date of around about 1360, 1350 BC, I think people would have to sit up and take notice that this very well could be the staff that parted the Red Sea. Until a carbon-14 test is carried out, many Egyptologists will remain skeptical of Philip's claim. The assertions which have been made over this are as far as I can tell, based partly on misinterpreting what some Egyptologists have said and on evidence which, as far as I can make out, doesn't even exist. It's been made up. But if he's right, and this staff does date back to 1350 BC, just maybe this museum holds one of the most prized relics in the world. If I was to be asked the question, have you found the staff of Moses? My heartfelt answer would be yes. To some, the adventures of this staff seem almost as miraculous as those of the biblical staff of Moses. Could this staff have more surprises in store?